is it's very important to come in for a consultation. You want to first, before you even decide on a treatment, you want to have a state-of-the-art MRI. Uh, you need to make sure, number one, the facility has the right MRI machine. You, you want to have, at a minimum, a 3 Tesla MRI, a 3T MRI. If you have a 1.5T MRI, you are not getting the same resolution. It's almost like getting, having a black and white TV image with a 1.5 Tesla MRI or an ultra high definition image with the 3 Tesla. You really need that technology. And we're one of the only centers in the world that use a dedicated 3 Tesla MRI for everything, for diagnosis, for our MRIs, our biopsies, and for the treatment. That's extremely important. Most centers in the United States have the 1.5 Tesla MRI, which is the magnet strength. It's much lower resolution, and unfortunately, that's what's more cost-effective to use. We don't cut any corners. We stick with state-of-the-art imaging, and I would encourage a patient that if they have had a 1.5 Tesla MRI to, uh, to go and get a 3 Tesla MRI. And if they are not uh, good candidates for laser ablation, we'll, I'll discuss it with them and then discuss better options. But at the very least now, they have an MRI, uh, they know how aggressive the tumor is, and they can go on and make a good decision. I've had guys who've come in to me who the urologist has said, uh, okay, you just have a small Gleason 6 or a low-grade tumor. Uh, let's just watch it because he, he biopsied it, just did ultrasound, didn't know the extent of the disease. The patient came in to me for a second opinion. I do the MRI. I can actually see that the prostate tumor is extending outside the prostate gland. And in fact, the, the area of highest uh, aggressiveness was not even sampled by the biopsy. I'll go in and sample it, and I've picked up Gleason 8 or 9 tumors that weren't sampled accurately because of the inferior technology, and now that patient needs to go on for aggressive therapy. They're not even a candidate for laser at that point. They need to go on for really uh, a really much more aggressive means of therapy. So the idea is that you really need, you know, that, that kind of guy would have gone on active surveillance and been watched when in fact we saved his life by showing him how aggressive his tumor was, that it was already extending through the prostate and he had a very limited window to get the right treatment. The typical scenario is a, a patient will go to his uh, general practitioner, his internist, and his PSA is elevated on his routine physical examination. PSA has gotten a lot of bad press. It's not a very bad test. And in fact, if you use PSA in conjunction with an MRI, it's a fantastic test. The PSA has what we call a very good sensitivity. It's very good at picking up cancers and not missing them, but it has a very poor specificity. Specificity means the ability to not detect something or, or call something a tumor when there is no tumor there. So a lot of times, patients will have just prostatitis. Most men in their lives will have some bout of prostatitis. It's just some inflammation of the prostate gland, which will cause their PSA to go up. The dilemma is if they don't get an MRI, they may go unnecessarily on to a biopsy. The urologist will just jump to do the biopsy, sample the, the prostate gland randomly, and pick up an incidental cancer. The patient now is burdened with this, this uh, diagnosis of cancer. It's a tremendous psychological burden. Um, and then what do they do? What's the next step? So in order to prevent these unnecessary treatments and biopsies, a new uh, way of approaching this or a new algorithm or paradigm shift needs to be adopted. That entails taking, uh, once the PSA is elevated and there is concern there's a cancer present, to do an MRI. If the MRI is negative, we know that there's no clinically significant disease present and perhaps the patient can go on and just be followed and not, and not have to, and perhaps not getting that biopsy or unnecessary treatment can really prevent a lot of uh, strain and psychological, uh, psychological, psychological distress on patients. Uh, so it's very important to have that MRI done. And if there is something there, at least we know with the MRI, we've found it, we've targeted it, biopsy the right area, and we haven't missed anything significant. So you know you're getting the most thorough workup with the MRI guidance, with the MRI uh, evaluation. In medicine, we can see prostate tumors, see the location, and we can accurately target them with a biopsy, meaning you don't have to do unnecessary uh, sampling, uh, random sampling all over the gland. There's no such thing as random randomness anymore. Today, if you go to a standard, uh, to your everyday urologist in the community, most of them will say, okay, well, you have a high PSA, your internist maybe, your general practitioner diagnosed you with a high PSA. And they'll say, well, the next step is you need to get a, um, a biopsy right away. No imaging, no pictures. So what they'll do is they, they use what I call a pin the tail on the donkey approach. I have picked up over 60 tumors that were missed by standard 
Urology means a biopsy just using ultrasound, but that random method. Part of it is that if you just randomly sample the, the prostate gland and you don't know where the tumor is, you may miss a very aggressive tumor that, the, that someone could actually uh, die from by not catching it on time. Um, a lot of men will have their PSAs after their first biopsy with, with the urologist and standard ultrasound uh, continue to rise. The PSA keeps going up and they're concerned. They're, they will know they have cancer. They know their PSA is high, but their, their problem is, what do I do? I, I, can't, I can't get treated now. They don't have a diagnosis. And unfortunately, a lot of these guys will go on for many years without a diagnosis until it's too late. Let's say they hit a tumor by accident. You don't know if they're getting an accurate picture of the aggressiveness of the tumor. The way I do the biopsy, I can actually see the most aggressive part of the tumor and know that I'm directly at the center of it and take a picture of that. So I'm not gonna under-diagnose. Over 40% of people who come to me who've already had the, the random biopsy and come in and we repeat the biopsy to really get a more accurate picture of the random biopsy is not giving us enough information, we uh, will upstage them uh, dramatically. So that it's very important to really have the targeted biopsy with the MRI uh, to get that picture. An MRI guided biopsy uh, is something where you just use, we just use minimal local anesthesia. Even in administering the local anesthesia, there's rarely uh, uh, any significant discomfort felt. Um, the, you're, you're actually, the individual is lying inside the MRI machine and we're taking uh, ac real, at that time, imaging. We're taking imaging as we go along to show us exactly where the tumor is and we have special, a special device that I use that specially localizes the tumor and helps me pinpoint exactly where it is and then stick, once I'm in the right location, then I stick the needle in and I can actually take a picture of the needle inside the tumor and, and actually document and show that we've, actually, we've really sampled the tumor accurately. Once I find the tumor with the MRI, the next step is, well, now that I can see where the tumor is, what can we do about that? And that's how kind of laser ablation came about and how I developed a lot of this technology. Uh, what we do is once we see the tumor on the MRI with the same localization software and approach that we use to locate the tumor and put a needle through it, instead of putting a needle, we put what's called a laser fiber. It's a, it's a thin plastic tube that we insert directly and gently into the tumor. What we do is with real time, this is all done in real time with real time feedback I'm on a monitor what we do is we raise the temperature of the laser fiber to over 60 degrees centigrade that's when we know there's cell death and that the tumor tissue is being destroyed uh, i put safety zones near the rectum near the urethra and the nerves and if i should even overheat by a minimal percentage near any of those sensitive structures the laser actually by itself will shut off and completely stop which protects the patient so it's almost impossible to get impotence or incontinence from this procedure. You maintain your erections, you maintain your urinary function, you don't have to wear diapers. This is the kind of thing that really maintains a man's quality of life. Uh, at the end of the day, when you look at a lot of the other treatments, and we can go into that later, a lot of the other treatments have uh, vast side effects uh, that really, really detract from someone's quality of life in, 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 in incredible ways. It's devastating to many couples. With laser ablation, what we can do is we can treat the tumor effectively. Uh, we can repeat it if we need to, if there's any new tumor tissue that comes in, and, uh, which is always possible. We can go in and reablate, so it, and we can always go on to more aggressive therapies later on down the line if you need them. If the tumor become new tumor comes in that's more aggressive, there is no other treatment that you can repeat as many times as you need to, as you can with laser. One thing that I'm passionate about is quality of life. Um, I had a patient come in to me, uh, 73 years old, very active man, uh, was playing golf, tennis every day, swimming, uh, had a wife who was uh, 55. Uh, his quality of life, his sexual function were of the utmost importance to him. He came in, we gave him local anesthesia, brought him in, did the uh, laser ablation, didn't feel any pain, came off the table, smiling, went to the bathroom, Went right, went right out to dinner that night with his wife. Celebrated, had sex that night, and, uh, and the next day he called me to tell me that he ran uh, six miles. This is the kind of, these are the kind of stories that I, I like to be able to, to share with people.